uh, my compliments to you. It's it's Friday night. I always encourage you to break your fast on Saturday uh, because I don't want you to press on Sunday morning. <laughs> and so some of some of you guys do uh, continue through Saturday, and of course that is up to you. Uh, if you choose to do that, there's not a, a rule per se that says you can't do that. But uh, I do know this on the fast that I have done, uh, particularly if you're preaching, it helps to break on Saturday <laughs> rather than Sunday. Uh, but that's just inside baseball. Uh, God bless you all for participating in this week of prayer and fasting. It has been our honor, our honor to take some time and set it apart unto the Lord. Uh, I, I share something funny with you very quickly. Uh, you guys know Dewan, our student pastor. Uh, he actually is at a commitment tonight at another church, but um, the best part of him is here. His wife is here, so um, she's 75% of his spirituality anyway, so <laughs> uh, he told me He told me Wednesday night, he said, you know what? You know, he's newlywed. He, he's newlywed, and uh, he, it's the first time he's done a fasting and it's married. He said, you know what? I've noticed this fasting is way harder when you're married because there's someone checking on you to see if you're really fasting. <laughs> I said, welcome to married life. Your wife may be the reason you make it to heaven, though, so don't begrudge her. Isn't that right, Brother Anthony? <laughs> So, God bless you all. It has been our uh, honor to have Brother and Sister Foster here this week ministering with us. That's right. Let's give them a hand. They are wonderful, lovely, dynamic people. Uh, I, uh, the, our families uh, go back uh, to a good few years, uh, and we have been, in many ways, we have been kind of knit together over the years. And, of course, Brother and Sister Foster are very dear friends of my mom and dad. And and of course, uh, other ministers in the in the region because of their years spent pastoring and preaching in this part of the country. And he is uh, elder. Brother Foster is an elder among us. Uh, he is a dynamic speaker among us. He is a successful pastor and leader among us. And I've asked him to open his heart and, and speak to us tonight. And I want us not simply to to view this service as you know we can come to church kind of on the level of well I hope we have a good service and uh, you know maybe maybe the, they'll sing my song or maybe the preaching will be for me uh, you can come to church like that and I'll be the first to say I, I've come to church many times that way I was just I was glad to be there but I wasn't really paying I wasn't focused let's put it that way but if you come to church focused it is as though you take a moment and you say all right uh, God God, would you speak into my life right now? God, what would you say to me right now? I'm here to tell you, uh, you need uh, the sovereign word of God spoke into your heart and into your life by men of God. And I want this service tonight, I would like all of us to take a moment and pause in, in our thought process and say, Lord Jesus, would you speak to our hearts, oh God? We're not just here in a routine of church attendance. Uh, we are here to receive of your word. We are here to receive what you would speak into our spirit. As an individual, I need it, O oh God. As a church body, we need it, O oh God. As a missional effort in this city, we need it, O oh God. Speak to us in Jesus' name. And would you all join with me, say, in Jesus' name, amen. Brother Foster, you're the man of God in this house for this service. Open your heart, speak to us, we're honored honored to have you. Thank you, Pastor. Somebody give God a little glory right now in the house. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Woo! It feels good in the house. Amen, amen. Oh, it just feels so good. We love being here, and uh, we do go way back, Pastor Nathan. We go way back, and... Uh, we, we go back to when our families together, between the two of us, didn't have two nickels to rub together. <laughs> we, go, we go back quite a ways. Amen. And you know what? It's just so wonderful to be here with this great church, you wonderful people. And then to be here with uh, Pastor Nathan and Sister Charla 
and uh, and then brother and sister Elms, and we've had a great time with these families, and just uh, we we we've had great times in the past, and now we're having great times right here, and uh, you you've got a wonderful pastor. God has put them here. Amen. Amen. And I, I, I love their passion. I love Pastor and, and Sister Charla's passion for God and for others. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. And, you know, at, at our church, uh, where I'm the bishop now, and Pastor Jason Ramsey is our pastor, but one of our major themes is reaching up to God and out to others. And that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. And and I feel the passion of your pastor and his wife. And and of course, they they are following in the passion that Brother and Sister Elms had. And it's just a just a beautiful, beautiful thing. And the worship, the worship team, I, I mean, and, and then just the worship. I feel the power of the Holy Spirit in this place. There's something about walking in here on a Friday night and feeling the power of God the way we feel him here right now. Amen. I'm looking forward to Sunday. I uh, can hardly wait till Sunday. I, I know God's going to do something powerful on that day. And, and, and I know he's got something here for us tonight. And already, I just feel closer to him. Feel closer to him. And, and I want to just preach to you for a few moments on this subject. Say it again. Say it again. Turn around and give somebody a high five and say, sometimes you got to say it again. <laughs> now, we all have battles to fight. We all have Goliaths. We all have giants that come into our lives. And there's so much in life that we don't get to choose. We can sometimes find ourselves in situations we don't understand. And whatever it is, we, we have just got to deal with it. Nobody escapes it. Any way you look at it, any way you slice it, life just keeps coming. Sometimes life is a fight. Sometimes life is a battle. There's times that we wonder if we are in a war. Sometimes it's a war of words, a war of wills, a war of just keeping my head above water, a war of surviving, a war of just making it. And perhaps uh, uh, somebody's in this fight because of the way you, you were raised. Uh, you, you, you know, uh, maybe somebody tore down every shred of confidence uh, that, that you had. Maybe somebody's in a battle this evening because mama and daddy didn't treat me right. Because they rejected me when I was a child. And I've suffered rejection all all my life uh, but I'm here to tell you in this week of passion this passion week uh, when we sacrifice something to God when we endeavor to draw closer to God and we endeavor to give more of ourselves to God I'm here to tell somebody that the battle is the Lord's I'm here to tell somebody that God knows where you are you see, sometimes life puts me in a situation where I have to fight a battle that maybe I had nothing to do with. Sometimes I'm in a fight that found me. I've been in a few of those. But what I'm telling you tonight is everybody 
has a story. Everybody has a battle. Everybody has a fight sometimes that they didn't choose. But this evening, on Friday night, I've come to tell you again, the battle is not yours, but the battle is the Lord's. David recognized this when he was approaching the fight with Goliath in 1 Samuel 17, 47. Then all the assembly shall know, and this is David speaking to the giant, uh, shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, uh, and he will give you into our hands. Uh, now, I want you to give somebody a high five and say, don't don't forget the battle is not yours, but the battle is the Lord's. And so there's one thing we've got to understand. We've got to understand on Friday evening in Charlotte that the battle is not mine, but the battle is the Lord's. This is not my fight. This is God's fight. And I've got to understand that wherever I am, whatever I'm going through, that God has my back. I'm declaring to somebody, don't claim something that is not yours. Don't claim something. That, that, that doesn't belong to you. Sometimes we try to fight the battle on our own and we end up feeling helpless and in despair and hopeless and that everybody's against us. But I'm declaring, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, I'm declaring tonight that God knows where you are. God knows what you're going through. God knows where you're walking. I'll never forget walking across that junior high school campus when I was just a lad. And I was a towering five feet two inches tall. I weighed all of 120 pounds. In fact, the giant of a man I am right now, I'm bigger than I've ever been. <laughs> you see, in, in our junior high school back in the day, we had what we called hoods. They may be called thugs today. I, I don't know, but, but, but the hoods, they hung out across the street before school. There was a grocery store, a little a convenience store. And we all liked to wear blue jean jackets back then, but they put the collar up. If you were a hood, you put the collar up on the blue jean jacket. And you kind of you <laughs> walked around like that, you know. And, and so they hung out before junior high school and they were, they were across the street smoking their cigarettes, acting tough. And some of them were tough. All right? For you see, there were some of these guys that had failed two or three times. There were some of these guys in junior high school that were shaving. <laughs> There were some of these guys that, that, that should have been in the 10th or the 11th grade, and they were still in junior, junior high back then was 7th, 8th, and ninth grade. And so I was walking across the campus, and I had my little blue jean jacket on with my collar turned down. And here came a big old boy walking across towards me. I knew who he was, but I didn't think he knew me. And, and uh, I, I didn't want any trouble with him. I, I, you know, I had never even spoken to him. And he come walking up and he grabbed my blue jean jacket and he turned it like that and kind of locked his fists into it. And he was looking down at me and he said, boy, and I was standing there like this. And he said, do you know what I'm going to do to you? And 
I was just so scared, I couldn't say a word. I just looked at him. And about that time, just out of the corner of my eye, I saw something that gave me a little courage and gave me a little faith because there was another hood that was coming up behind him and he put his arms out like this with his fist real wide and he hit him right here hard. Knocked the breath out of him. He, uh, he grabbed himself and he slid all the way down and he laid in the floor and finally said, what did you do? And he couldn't catch his breath. Finally said, that for? And the old boy that helped me looked at him and he said, don't you ever touch this boy again or you will deal with me. Do you understand me? And he turned around, he looked at me and he said, come on. And you know what I did? I walked away with my Savior. I swaggered away with my Savior. My Savior had come in and saved me. You know what I found out that day? I found out that the battle was not mine, but the battle was my Savior's. I'm preaching to somebody right now. You're in a battle right now, but the battle is not yours. Ha -ha. Is anybody hearing me preach? I'll never forget the day my brothers came home from school. They, they finally grew up to where they could, they could take care of me. They could take up for me. They, they were my little brothers, but they became my big brothers. All right. And, but they came home from school one day. I was in high school. They were in junior high. And so they, they had ridden the bus and they were in Ross Sterling. It was a junior senior high school. So the, and, and I drove to school when we had moved, I stayed at Milby high school. And so I drove to school. So they came in one day and they said, they said, Mark, they said, there's a couple of seniors that, that are on the, on ride our bus and they, they are just picking on us like, like nobody's business. And I said, they are, huh? I said, yeah. I said, you know where they live? I said, I know where one of them lives. And I said, uh, let's go talk to him. Get in the car. And I had a little Volkswagen. So we got in this little old, little old bug and we rolled along and they showed me where the house was and I come ro we come rolling up right in front of that house and he just so happened to be outside and I hollered, I said, hey, look at me. And he looked at me. He said, what, what, what do you want? I said, you see these two brothers of mine in this car? I said, you better never pick on them again or you're going to deal with me. I said, you want some of me now? <laughs> he said, man, I don't want any trouble with you. And in my heart, I said, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> And then the next day I got home from work and uh, Tim and Tom were already home from school. And I said, well, how'd it go today? They said, man, it was a different day. I said, we got on the bus this morning and said, that guy got on the bus and he wouldn't even look at us. He just walked by us and said, about that time, the next stop his buddy got on and his buddy turned his senior ring backwards and was just getting ready to hit his own top of the head with it. And his buddy from back of the bus said, George, don't hit them. They've got a big brother that goes to Milby High School and he is bad. <laughs> what I've got to understand is when I try to fight the battle myself, I get in trouble. But if I can understand like David did that the battle is the Lord's. You see, we don't get to choose our abusers and losers. We just get to choose how we respond. You see, and we're all, everybody's trying to recover from something that we didn't choose. Everybody's got a story that they didn't choose. And David pastor walked into a battle that he didn't choose. 
He walked into a fight uh, that he had no idea that he was going to fight. He was still a kid. He was a shepherd boy who took care of the family sheep. Uh, and his daddy sent him with cheese sandwiches uh, to the war and said, I want you to take these to your brothers. Now the scripture says in 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 23, then as David talked with his brothers, there was the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, coming up from the armies out of the Philistines, and he spoke according to the same words. So David heard them, and all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. So the men of Israel said, and they were talking to David, have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come to defy Israel, and it, now watch this close and it shall be that the man who kills him the king will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and give his father's house exemption from taxes in all of our in Israel so the army is afraid they're trembling they they are scared to death and David small though he is young though he is he grasped the gravity of the situation there's a screaming giant out there and my brothers and the army, I've never seen them like this before, but they are literally scared to death. But I want you to watch what David did when he heard the giant and when he heard then the men speak. Verse 26, then David spoke to the men who stood by him saying, what shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? You know what he said? He said, wait a minute. I heard what you said, but let me make sure you said it right, that I, or that I heard it right. Say it again. Tell me again what is going to happen. And they told him again. And sometimes... In your life, and sometimes in my life, I've got to say it again. I'll never forget. I'll never forget when we were in Winston-Salem. We'd been there just 10 days at this time. The first couple of nights, we slept on the floor in, in that little, little church office. And we realized we were beginning to realize how bad it really was and brother and sister elms understand all of that and every day when i went to the mailbox there was letters from collection agencies and lawyers i couldn't write a church check to make the church payment. They were considering foreclosing on the building. The only reason they had not done it was because it was a church and they would get bad publicity. I found out that the pew company had already dispatched a truck to come get a pews. I found that out on the day it happened and it was within this 10 day period. And so we, we, we didn't know what to do, but I found out at the end, at the, uh, on this, the 10th day, how bad it really was. Somebody brought all the bills, stacked them on that little desk. Now, let me tell you this. There was no mismanagement of funds. There simply was not, there were no funds to manage. <laughs> all right. Anybody ever been there? Yeah. And so, this was one of the times, maybe, or maybe the only time that Paul and I were discouraged at the same time. I was sitting behind that little metal desk and she was sitting over on the other side. The devil had jumped on my shoulder and he said, preacher boy, it's time you get out of town. Most folks don't even know you're here. You've been very successful evangelizing. You have still got place, enough places to preach that if nobody else asks you to come, you've got three years worth of bookings. You can keep that, get your family, and get out of town, or everybody's going to know old Foster's a failure. 
the sad thing is the preacher was listening. And about that time, the door creaked open. Now, normally, some folks think I may be, a, I don't know, a little wired or, or, or hyper or something. And uh, so, so anyway, I, I would normally jump up, but I was discouraged. Pastor, I just sat there behind that little desk. And in walked a drunk. You could tell very quickly he was inebriated. And he looked at me. And he said, preacher. And then he started trying to find me with his finger. <laughs> he took a couple of steps back. Finally, he anchored himself on the doorpost and he found me. <laughs> and he said, preacher, God sent me. And in my mind, I looked up and I said, thank you a lot, God. <laughs> this is all I need. <laughs> and then... He wasn't drunk anymore. He was stone cold sober. And he said, preacher, God sent me and God told me to tell you that he has sent you here. He has called you to Winston-Salem. And if he called you, he's going to keep you. And he told me to tell you that this is your city. He's going to give you revival. And don't you think about leaving. Man. was drunk again <laughs> and he kind of got off the doorpost took a couple of steps backwards looked at me waved at me and took off and over his shoulder said pray for me preacher and out the door he went Paul and I jumped up I ran around that little desk we were laughing we were crying we, we, we were jumping up and down we were praising God but hear me hear me let me tell you what happened Whenever we would get discouraged, we would tell that story. Whenever we'd get discouraged, we'd tell that story to one another. We said, hey, God called us. God, and if God, and let me tell you, if God can use a donkey, God can use a drunk man, and God sent him in there. And so I'm declaring to somebody, you need to say it again. God has promised uh, that he's going to bring me through this. Uh, God has promised uh, that I'm going to make it, so I'm just going to say it again. Yeah. 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 Woo! And that's what, that's what David did. Now, I want you to watch this. Verse 28. Now, Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men and Eliab's anger was aroused against David and he said why did you come down here and with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness I know your pride and the insolence of your heart for you have come down to see the battle now mind you again David stepped into a battle that he didn't choose and he's about to go out and face a giant he's never seen a man this big he's never had a fight like this and now his big brother is trashing him it is not only the giant but it's his own brother but that's not all hear me and hear me well when the prophet said Samuel came to anoint one of Jesse's sons, uh, the king. Jesse left David in the field with the sheep. He didn't even consider him. Amen. That's right. Where his daddy saw a kid, God saw a king. Is anybody hearing me? And so now David has a choice to make. Am I going to fight my brother or am I going to fight Goliath? And sometimes you've got to make that choice. Psalm 55 and, and verse 12 says, for it was not an enemy who reproaches me. Then I could bear it. Nor is it one who hates me, who has exalted himself against me. Then I could hide from him. But it was you. 
you, a man my equal, my companion, and my acquaintance, when we took, or we took sweet counsel together and walked to the house of God in the throng. You see, but David understood. You know what I'm going to do? I'm not going to be distracted on the way to my destiny. I thought I was bringing lunch, but I found out I was bringing destiny. You see, sometimes you think you're just doing something mundane. You think you're just doing something ordinary and, and an everyday thing when you've really got destiny in your hands. David had his own destiny in his hands. Now I want you to watch what David did in verse 29. He's talking to his brother and he said, what have I done now? Is there not a cause? Now watch close. Verse 30, then he turned from him toward another and said the same thing. What's the same thing? He said, say it again. <laughs> so he turned away, pastor. He turned away, brother Elms, from his brother who was trashing him. And he said, you know what? I'm not going to fight with you. Say it again. I want to tell me again. What you, you mean? You mean I'll get the king's daughter if I go out and whip this guy? You mean my family will have no taxes? The rest of my, my father's house? will have no taxes. You know what he did? He said, I'm going to go out even though this brother is trashing me and I'm going to fight so that he'll have no more taxes. Uh, I'm going to fight so my dad will have no more taxes. Uh, he said, say it again. He refused. When destiny was on the line, he refused to fight with his brother. So what I'm preaching to somebody tonight is don't get distracted on the way to your destiny. The devil will bring every kind of, of insults or every kind of distraction to you. I remember, Pastor, I was preaching in Raleigh for Brother Ballestero and Brother Huntley and uh, I preached this message. And after church, a couple of boys came up. They were probably 10 or 12 years old. Wanted me to sign their Bible. And I looked at them. And I said, my goodness, these are two fine looking fellas here. And one little guy just leaned his head back and said, say it again. <laughs> and I knew he had got, he, he got it. He got, he got the message. You see, David knew the fear uh, that was in the camp. Uh, but David said, I'm going to let God fight my battle. I thought I was bringing lunch, but I found out I'm bringing destiny. I refuse to bow to what others are running from. I'm going to declare it. Say it again. I want to hear it again. You, you see, sometimes... Uh, we declare I've got this when we ought to be declaring God's got this. Uh, somebody tonight needs to declare the battle is the Lord's. Uh, the battle is the Lord's. Uh, somebody needs to make a decision. I'm giving it all to God tonight. Uh, you see, David decided I'm not going to fight my brother, but I'm going to do what God wants me to do and I'm going to go out and I'm going to fight this giant. I'm not a soldier. I'm just a boy. But fighting Goliath will change my life. Killing Goliath will change where I sleep, will change how I live, will change who I marry, will change my father's family for the better, will change my future. David, if you kill this giant, you're going to live in an entirely different world. Yes, yes. And so I'm preaching to somebody tonight. And I want you to say to yourself, who is this devil that would take my job, that would take my marriage, that would take my kids, that would take my health, that would take my family, that would take my future? Wow. Wow, 
whatever giant you're facing tonight, God has this. And I've got to hear David say, I believe I can hear David say, Eliab, you're a part of my history, but I'm not going to let you become part of my destiny because I've got destiny over here. My destiny is not to fight you, but my destiny is to walk in the fear of Almighty God. Woo! Hallelujah. I've got a whole lot more, but let me let me cut through this. God knows where you are. He knows what you're going through. He knows your battle. He knows your broken dreams. He knows what's going on in your life right now. And he knows where you're going to be tomorrow. But you've got to keep holding on. Yeah. He's going to bring you through. Yeah. I want to read a scripture. Where's uh, Brother Nathan? Music. Come on up here. And all the guys that helped us the other night, can y'all come back? You got it, you got it, you got me a, a group here, yes, sir. Brother Nathan? Yes, sir. All right. Y'all come on, men. Y'all come very quickly. Thank you. Oh, looky here, man. We got some great guys here. All right. Hey, we got some big old boys up here, too. <laughs> Feel good having these guys around me as bodyguards. I don't want I don't want to be against these guys. All right, now I want you to watch this close. Psalm 137, begin with verse one. By the rivers of Babylon we wept. There we sat down, yea, we wept. When we remembered Zion, we hung our harps upon the willows in the midst of it. For there those who carried us away captive ask of us a song. And those who plundered us required mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. Verse 2. Well, verse 1, they cried. Verse 2, they hung their harps on the willows. All right? So, they hung their guitars up. They pushed their drums aside. They shoved the keyboard back. And they said, we can't do this. We, they, they took them into Babylonian captivity. And so no longer were they free people. But now they were slaves. And they were forced to live as slaves. And their, their captives said, you're noted for your music and your singing. Sing for us right now some of those songs. And they begin to cry. And they begin to hang all their musical instruments up and shove them aside. And so, guys, what I need, I need you to help me. Okay? I need you to cry really loud. <laughs> All right, on the count of three, I want you to wail, all right? Ready? Would y'all like to see this? Yeah. Give them a hand. Give them a hand. They're getting ready to perform for us. All right, you going to help me, guys? Are we on the same team? Y'all going to help me? All right, all right. On the count of three. I want to see who can cry the loudest, who can wail the loudest. Okay? Are you ready? Here we go. One. Countdown, folks. One. One. Come here, Brother Nathan. All right. You are officially Ezekiel. Your name just changed to Ezekiel. We call him Zeke. All right? All right. Yeah. Ezekiel Elliott. Oh, that went over a lot of your head because y'all have the Panthers here. All right. 
here we go. All right, now, in Ezekiel chapter 37, well, let, let's just, let, let, let's, let's go to Ezekiel chapter 1 first. Now, watch this close. Now, it came to pass, this is Ezekiel speaking, in the 30th year, in the fourth month of the year, on the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river Chebar, that the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. Now, I, I, I did a little research here and what I found out uh, was uh, this all took place at just about the same time. And he was a captive. Ezekiel was a captive. Chebar was a river in Babylon and he was a captive in Babylon. They hung their harps on the willows uh, but there was one man that said I'm going to praise him. I'm going to magnify him. I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to give up but I'm going to push forward. And so while these guys were weeping and crying, he Ezekiel had his hands in the air and he was seeing visions of God. All right, guys, I want you to wail and I want you to worship. All right, wail. Worship. Yeah. Woo. Now you got one guy here that's got his hands up. Uh-huh. Now you see what's happened? Let me tell you what happened. You know what happened here? God began to speak to this guy while these guys are crying. All right, that's good, guys. Give him a hand. Give him a hand. Now, now, what I want you to what I want you to watch. He had visions of God, and he began to say, "I'm going to say it again." I'm in captivity, but I'm going to say it again. I'm in captivity, but you are my God. I didn't plan on this, but I'm staying with you. I'm going to worship you. It doesn't matter how bad it gets. It doesn't matter what's happening in my life. And God kept speaking to him. Yes, God. So while they were discouraged, while they were depressed, while they were disheartened and downhearted and and they were feeling sorry for themselves and they were weeping and crying, he was hearing from God. And verse 37, or verse, uh, chapter 37, verse 1 says, Ezekiel speaking, The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, and it was full of bones. And he caused me to pass by them all round about, and behold, there was very many in the open valley. All right, now, guys, Y'all going to still help me, right? Thank you, man. Y'all are doing fantastic. Y'all are doing fantastic. All right, now here's what I'm going to need next. We're, we're getting ready to bring this thing to a close. But here's what I need next. Guys, I want to see which one of you guys knows how to die the best. <laughs> Step back a little bit, Ezekiel. Spread out a little bit, guys. We don't want to hurt. We don't want to knock the keyboard over. We don't want to, we don't want to knock the, y'all, y'all get a little room. Oh, come on over here. Spread on out a little bit. Why? Come on around there. Come on, come on here, guys. Ezekiel, just get out. Don't let them hurt you now, you know. Okay. All right. Yeah, move that microphone out of the way. There we go. There we go. Don't fall on that and break that uh, hatch there, okay? All right. Now, uh, here's what we're going to do. We're going to count it down. Uh, we're going to do it backwards this time. Three, two, one. Okay? And when we hit one, you guys die and fall out. All right? Here we go. Are you ready, guys? All right. Ready? Three, two, one. Bang! Oh. <laughs> Woo! Ho, ho! <laughs> Give him a hand. So, no, no, no. You're, you're, you're dead, guys. You're dead. We got one still twitching over here. All right. The hand of the Lord is on me, Ezekiel said. And he set me down in the middle of dry, get over here in the middle of these dry bones. 
he set me down in the middle of some dry bones and he caused me to walk all around them and indeed they were very dry and he said son of man can these bones live and Ezekiel was a smart man he said oh Lord you know yeah, uh, all right you got that yeah. say oh Lord you know oh Lord you know. you know, all right. And again, he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, oh, bones, hear the word of the Lord. When I was in elementary school, we had they, had, they put on a little play and a guy got up there in a skeleton suit and he sang that old song that went something like bones, dim, bones, dim, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. And then he said, the toe bone connected to the foot bone, foot bone connected to the ankle bone, ankle bone connected to the shin bone, hear the word of the Lord. And that's kind of how it went. Uh, he began to prophesy, began to prophesy, say, oh, bones, I want you to live. I want you to, I want you to come together. I want you to come together. All right. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to say, Charlotte, we're reaching for you. Charlotte, we're reaching for you. Charlotte, we're reaching for the dry bones. <laughs> And you know what happened? Those bones begin to slither. A toe bone from over here connected with a foot bone from over there. Ha yeah. ha. Whoa. My, my. Ha. Now watch this. Thus saith the Lord, surely prophesy to the bones, say, O bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord uh, to these bones, surely I'll put breath in you and you shall live. I'll cover you with sinew, bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin, put breath in you, and then you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied, he said, as I commanded. I prophesied and there was a noise and a rattling and the bones came together and indeed I looked and flesh came on them and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. So he's in the middle now of a, just a bunch of dead people laying out here. He's in a graveyard, and you may be in the graveyard of broken dreams. You may be in the graveyard of broken promises. You, you, you may wonder if you're ever going to get a miracle, but I'm telling you something is getting ready to happen in your life. Something's getting ready to happen in your family. Something's getting ready to happen and you're going to change the history of your family. And so the Lord said this, prophesy to the breath, prophesy and say to the breath, thus says the Lord, come from the four winds and breathe that these may live. And he prophesied. Now I want you to prophesy. I'm prophesying revival. I'm prophesying to Charlotte. Prophesy come on. Revival yeah. In Charlotte. Yeah. I'm prophesying to them. Yeah. Hallelujah. Now you know what happened then about that time they begin to stir yeah. breath the Holy Spirit that's what that's symbolic of the Holy Ghost uh, the, the breath that came into them and they begin to stir all right these old bones are beginning to stir now and then they got up on their feet the Bible says uh, an exceeding great uh, army is anybody hearing me right now Where did Ezekiel go? All because Ezekiel was saying, I'm going to say it again. I'm not going to give up. I'm going to say it again. Woo! Woo! Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I feel the power of the Holy Spirit in the house. Amen, amen, amen. If you want to say it again, if you want to dream again, you know what I see? I see three services on Sunday morning. I see four services on Sunday morning. <laughs> I see this place pack jam four times on Sunday morning. There's revival here. Your family's coming in. Your friends are coming in. God's going to use you. My Lord. If you believe that, if you if you want to say, I'm going to say it again, I'm going to believe God for the promise. I want you to come down here as fast as you can. Come down here believing God. I'm believing God for it right now. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Woo! Yes, 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 yes. There's power in First Church. 
Thank you for watching First Church Charlotte. If you're in the Charlotte, North Carolina area, worship with us at 4929 North Sharon Amity Road. For information about service times, church ministries, and so much more, visit us online at firstchurchclt.com. If you would like to support our efforts, text GIVE to 704-445-5353. We pray God's richest blessings to you. Come, worship with us.